Hello everyone, welcome back to the next chapter in our Briar Rose. We're now on chapter 5 and we're back to Briar Rose. I steer my Land Rover up the dirt path that leads to Ellie's cabin. The night sky sparkles with a crazy number of stars. Pine trees loom on either side of the road. I drive past the Thorn Alarms, a deserted hotel that sits high atop a forested hill. I can't help but grin. Seeing that old wreck of a hotel means that my drive is almost over. Ella's cabin is only two minutes away now, and I glance at my watch. 2.13am. I didn't make bad time, all things considered. A ratted log cabin appears through the trees. My headlights reflect off the darkened windows. It's a three-room deal, with a fireplace and an outhouse. But it stores my computer set up well enough. When it comes to analysing my papri data, no place is better than Ella's cabin. I pull the rover up to the cabin, grab my bag and step outside. This moment is one I always savour. That first rush of fresh air. It stings my lungs with its purity and reminds me of all my plans for the future. A typical high school, regular college. A normal life. But until then, I have my papri to focus on. I hoist my bag higher over my shoulder, trek up the short flight of stairs to the cabin's front door. This far out in the wilderness, a lot of cabins aren't locked. That said, a lot of cabins aren't owned by a thief. So Ella's place comes complete with a full set of keys and deadbolts. It takes me a minute or two, but I'm soon inside. The cabin is rustic looking, with small bedroom, smaller kitchen, sizable living room. Most of the furniture is shabby stuff that Ella and I picked up at a garage, garage sales in the village. The bedroom roof leaks. All the walls are filled with mice. The place is a total dump. That is, except for the living room. That's completely high tech. I have stainless steel tables in here and half a dozen wall monitors. My heart lightens. I can't wait to get to work. Now that I'm inside, I have a system for how I set things up. Generator first, fireplace second, third, I make a pot of humongous tea and change into my favourite gym jams, which are a combination of body shots and a kami. Only then, when all the prep work is done, do I fire up my computer, flip on my wall of monitors and check out my latest Ilgot and Papri pics. All of which brings me to the present moment. Right now, I'm sitting in my favourite rolling chair, sipping my tea, waiting for my latest hieroglyphs to appear on the computer screen before me. The monitors flicker with a blue light before, and yes, there they are, new hieroglyphs. I can't believe it. These are the best ones I've ever gotten. Like always, they're only fragments. At one time, they were full papyrus sheets. And together, they made up ancient books of magic. There were about five copies of this book. They were all stored in the library of Alexandro. But when Julius Caesar's invaded, he burned the library to charcoal. If the papyri hadn't been infused with magic themselves, they would never have survived. But they did. Now I'm rebuilding the book on magic, piece by burned up piece. It's even trickier because it's written in special kind of hieroglyphs called the Code of Isis. Only a few high-level priests and priestesses could read it. Carving any bit into rock was forbidden. I find burned out fragments and put them together like a giant juggle. Like a puzzle, I guess. As hobbies go, I've heard of worse ways to spend your time. Not that I had much choice about the whole thing. I kept dreaming about assembling one hieroglyph in the Book of Magic over and over. It was so boring, I thought I'd go insane. Once I started doing my research, the dreams finally went away, only to get replaced with dreams of Knox. We laugh, talk all night, work on papri. I can't remember much of what happens in the morning, but I do know this. It's anything but boring. I click through my pics, one after another, 
And finally, I run across some glyphs that are definitely from the Code of Isis. Hieroglyphs or pictograms, so every word is represented by an image. The Code of Isis uses totally unique images, nothing you find elsewhere in ancient Egypt. I run across a fragment with the unique hieroglyphs for wizard, fairy, and shifter. Bingo. I found another puzzle piece. Now I just need to figure out where it fits. I gulp down my tea and get to work. This is where the fun begins. Finding the right home for each new fragment in my master copy of the Book of Magic. Back in ancient times, about 20 scrolls made up this particular book. Each one was about five feet long when unrolled. To see each page fully and still be able to read it, I must span all four of my computer monitors. With a few button clicks, the first scroll appears on the screen, and I drag the new hieroglyphs onto different parts of the image, trying to find out where these three pictograms fit into my master puzzle. Not only this task consumes all my focus, but tonight, I can't seem to stay focus on my track. My attention keeps wandering to another image entirely. Silky black hair, a scar along his jawline, the haunting look in his ice blue eyes, knocks. And that scent, sandalwood and musk. Why is the very thought of it hypnotising? I press my palms onto my eyes. Forget, growling men. Tonight is about the book of magic. It's taken me years. But I've got one quarter of the thing put together. Sure, it's a compulsion to complete the task I saw in my dreams. But that doesn't mean I'm not proud of what I've done. And there's no way I'll stop now. A mechanical buzz fills the air. My monitors flicker and turn dark. The only light in the cabin comes from the fireplace in the living room. The sound of my own breathing seems incredibly loud. I freeze. This is so weird. The generator sometimes dies in winter, but never in May. I pull up my bag, take a deep breath of meds from my inhaler. It never hurts to do a preemptive strike against a possible episode. After that, I open the top drawer on my desk, where I keep my favourite gun, 7mm Glock, and its leather holster. Miss Chang is more than an expert in mixed martial arts. She also taught me about guns. After slipping on my Glock and holster, I head outside to check the generator. What can I say? I'm a cautious girl. The moment I step outside, I'm hit with cool air and a cacophony of insect noises. I stare back at the cabin door. It's wide open. Crap. I forgot to grab the keys as well. Maybe I should go back inside and hunt for them. I debate the idea for all two seconds before giving up. Fiddling with the locks in the dark isn't my idea of a good time. I need to get the generator back up and working. Besides, I won't be gone long. I pad barefoot over the hefty metal box that sits around the back of the cabin. It's hard to find my way, but there's a little light from the moon. I stub my toe on a rock. Too bad I thought of a gun before a flashlight. I make it to the generator and sure enough, one of the extension cables fell out. Usually, ice weighs these things down in the winter, but I suppose a raccoon or something might get into it this time of year. I plug the line back into place. Brightness flickers inside the cabin once more. I hug my elbows, and not just from cold. The idea of having lost everything I was working on sends a chill through my bones. When did I last save my file? I can't remember. Crap, if I lose my work, I'm going to freak. When you have files as big as mine, autosave can take a while to finish. If you lose power mid-save, it can corrupt everything. Damn. I rush into the cabin and hustle over to the mega desk of the computer, gadgetry. After pressing a few buttons, the monitors come back to life. I scan them carefully and exhale. Whew! I lost a few little things, but not too much. In fact, I'm about to redo the work, when I feel it. The cool muzzle of a gun against my, the back of my head. What the hell? Hands up, Sherry. Oh, it's Madame Grimoire, and she's holding a gun to my skull. 
Lessons from Miss Chang raced through my mind. Unfortunately, I don't have a good way to disarm Madame from this angle. I need to buy some time. In an effort to keep my voice casual, what are you doing here? In reply, there's an unmistakable sound of her cocking the gun. Miss Chang taught me all about this stuff, too. A jolt of worry zings through my limbs. Blanche disappeared. And now Madame is in my secret cabin with a gun. Not a great situation. I raise my arms. Fine! My hands are up. Madame's arm darts around me in a flash of movement. She pulls my gun out of my ulster. Great. My weapon is history. Turn around, she orders. With shuffling steps, I slowly spin about. Madame still looks like she did in our group session today. A brown hair is frozen into a perfectly curled bob. An A-line dress with a out crease, not a crease is in it. She's even wearing white gloves. Although now, they make a little more sense if she's been shooting people. The gloves might help hide the evidence on skin, which is not a comforting thought, really. Madame raises her free hand. My burn phone is gripped in her fingers. She tightens her grip, and the device gets smashed to bits. And that's a shocker. I mean, it's already overwhelming that she found me and broke in here, but that's a pretty solid object. Who goes around smushing things with their bare hands? Who are you really? I ask. What do you want? Madame smiles, and it's not the nice kind. Answer some questions, and I'll kill you quickly. I glance around the room, searching for any kind of weapon. Don't bother trying to escape, says Madame. You've made the mistake of warning me all about your battle training. That's why I sabotage your generator. I know you were experienced and would require a sneak attack. When I kidnapped Blanche, I merely knocked on the door and asked to let me in. Every inch of my body seems to go numb. Wow. Madame really is planning to kill me. Not that the load of gun wasn't a tip-off, but the fact that she confessed to going after Blanche. It's not a great sign for yours, truly. Madame keeps right on talking. I guess she wasn't expecting any response about the whole kidnapping Blanche thing. Let's begin. How long have you been in love with Philpot? What? Of all the questions she was going to ask, I did not see that one coming. I'm not in love with Philpot at all. He's a loser. No, he's wonderful. Madame motions to the monitors with a gun. You've been trying to impress him with this research, haven't you? Show him that you're more than a pretty face, am I right? Philpot doesn't know anything about my work here. Liar. Someone like you doesn't, de doesn't deserve to live. Besides, you look delicious. Delicious? The word tumbles from my mouth before I can stop it. Madame stares at the monitors, her eyes narrowing. What are you doing here? A plan forms. If Madame is curious about the papri, I might be able to use that to my advantage. I'm translating the Book of Magic. She seems really fixated on my work. So maybe that would be somewhat interesting to her. No, no, that's not possible. The Denari have been trying to reassemble that text for ages without success. My mind races through the few things I've learned from the Book of Magic. I know about the three wardens in the fountain. Her eyes widen. You know who the wardens are? Sure. In truth, I had no idea who they are. It's a closely guarded secret. And where is the fountain? Do you know where the fountain is too? Absolutely. I don't know what proper lie. It's all right here on my monitor screen. Come take a look. And get close enough so I can disarm you. Madam takes a half step nearer. That's an improvement. But it's not close enough for me to take a gun. What does it say about the fountain? I point to the monitor. Right behind me. The location is clearly written out. Do you know any hieroglyphs? A few. Madam squints. Trying to see that corner more clearly. Do you have any idea what would happen if someone found that fountain? She takes another half step closer. My heart pounds so hard it feels like a cold burst from my chest. Only one more step, only one more step, and Madame will be close enough for me to disarm her. 
The glyph of the fountain is four wavy lines in a circle. You can see it here, in the bottom left corner. Which is the truth? The glyph in the corner. But it's also true that she'll need to step closer than ever to see it properly. Four wavy lines in a circle. Ah, I see it now. Madame's gaze stays locked on the monitor as she finally takes another step. Gotcha. My training from Miss Chang comes back with vengeance. I step to one side, grab the nozzle of the gun and twist hard. A snap of bone sounds as Madame's finger breaks. From there, I grab Madame's arm and flip her on her back. A few moves later, and I have both guns again, and Madame at my mercy. Triumph flares through my soul. I can't wait to tell Ella about this one. I reset my gun into my holster, using both hands. I point the other straight at Madame's head. Now it's your turn to talk. Who are you, really? Why? I'm one of the Denarii, of course. The Denarii are good peoples. They're humans were trying to save magic. I pull back the hammer on the gun. That's not you. Oh, I'm a true Denarii, all right. And you, my dear are ridiculously naive. Madame slowly rises to her feet. Stand still or I'll shoot. The crazy lady steps closer to me. I don't doubt it. Stop! The room starts to go hazy around me. Silver spots appear in my vision. All my limbs turn rubbery. That lockdown container inside my soul rattles. It's that damn spell from Colonel Mallory trying to break loose. Oh, damn. My last dose of medicine wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Now, on top of everything, I'm about to have an episode. If that happens, I'll really be dead. It's an effort to keep my eyes open. I said, stop. Never. Madame moves closer. Don't take another step. She does just that. The world seems to move in slow motion as I squeeze the trigger on my Glock. Boom. Once I start, I can't seem to stop. Spine-wrenching blasts echo through the cabin. A small wall appears in the centre of Madame's forehead as she gets thrown backwards, crashes as the bullet ricochets around the room. With trembling hands, I set the gun aside. I told you to stop. Madame lies at my feet, lifeless. This is terrible. The next thing I know, silver spots are clouding my vision again. Inside my soul, the lockbox that holds my curse begins to fracture. No, no, no. I cannot have an episode with a dead madam on my floor. I race over to my bag, pull out my inhaler and suck in a few breaths. Every breath still feels so much better than the last. The medicine tastes like hell, but it does the trick. My vision clears, but my body still feels like a wet noodle. I slump on the floor by madam's feet and force myself to look at her. The odd thing occurs to me that for a head wound, she really didn't make much of a mess on the carpet. She didn't make too much of a mess. What's wrong with me? I just killed a fellow human being. Sure, Madame called herself a true denari and came after me, but that didn't mean she deserved to die. I just panicked. My skin chills with shock and fear. What do I do with a dead body anyway? One name appears in my mind, Ella. I need to contact my best friend. She might know someone who specialises in this kind of thing. I set my hand on my chest, trying to force my breath to slow down. That's a good plan. That's a good plan. It's a good plan. Call Ella. My stomach sinks. I would call Ella, except for the fact my cell phone got destroyed. Madame crushed the thing to bits. I glance over her shoulder at my computer set up. The monitors are all dark. A huge bullet hole peeps out from the hard drive. Damn. The system was damaged. I shot the gun at Madame so many times. Oh, that sucks, that sucks. I could have used the computer to patch through an IP line. Get to Ella's phone. Suddenly, Madame twitches. Now, I read about how bodies do strange things during rigor mortis. But that takes a long time to set in. There's no way Madame should be moving right now. She flinches again. Uh, it actually seems like Madame is still alive. 
In one single movement, Madame rises to her feet. Although it's more like she's levered up by some invisible board, rather than actually shifting her weight like a normal person would. Shock charges through my nervous system. I scream and head off. Madame is alive and coming for me, even though she has a bullet hole in her head and everything. My mind blanks. How do I kill someone who's already dead? I watch her approach. I think through all my lessons with Miss Chang. Madame may be magical, but I'm stubborn. Whatever's going on, I won't go down without a fight. And that's the end of this chapter of Briar Rose. Thank you for listening to this part and many blessings. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel and to Briar Rose. This is episode 6, it's Nox. My throat tightens with another howling growl. For the last 10 minutes I've done nothing but drive up and down this same damn road. All I've got to show for it are a lot of trees, darkness and frustration. No sign of Briar Rose in our cabin. Yeah, my GPS tells me that I'm right at the address, but there's nothing here. I grip the steering wheel of Alex's Mustang with extra force. Get a hold of yourself, Knox. Chances are Briar Rose is fine. Whatever feelings you have for this girl are just hormones, pure and simple. That thought should make me feel better. But it doesn't. I can feel my wolf inside me pacing the inner walls of my soul. He wants his mate, and he thinks Briar Rose is it. What a shit show. Not to mention that the marks on my back. Marks that every warden has are now pulsing with power. It's what happens when my wolf is really upset. Well, my inner wolf may be losing it, but my mind is still intact. There's no way Briar Rose is my maid. She's human. Where's only mate with our own kind? And then, there's the fact that I can't mate with anyone. I'm one of the three, just like Alec. But my wolf is having none of it. He howls inside me, calling for me to find her. I punch the roof instead. Shut the hell up, will you? Sometimes yelling at my wolf helps. This isn't one of the times, though. He only howls louder. I slam my skull back against the headrest. Come on, man. You know who we are. Wardens never find a mate. I scrub my hand down my face because, damn it, my wolf is freaking out worse by the second. I jam on the gas and pull over to a clearing. It'll be a bitch getting the Mustang out of here. My wolf is howling for me to stop. I kill the ignition and step out into the night. The air's crisp and still. Good. If Briar Rose is anywhere nearby, then I'll send her easily enough. Normally I strip down before making the change to my animal form, but my wolf isn't having any of that. The second I step away from the car door, he rips through my skin. Damn, this part always hurts. My bones snap and realign. Fingers stretch into talons, muscles contort, and every inch of me hurts like hell. Within seconds, I'm a huge badass black wolf with golden eyes. This was not how I planned to spend my Thursday night. I snort in a deep breath, checking to see if my wolf is right or crazy. There's no scent of Briar Rose on the air. Crazy it is then. See, my logical self rails inside my head, told you there was nothing. We were just going to drive past her place, and now I'm all in wolfed up. You freak. Don't get any ideas. I'm not chasing rabbits around just to... Plague it, your sorry ass. My wolf's guttural voice echoes through my thoughts. Danger, he growls. My wolf isn't one for long sentences, as a rule. Mate. I'm about to launch into a long lecture about how we can never have a mate when it happens. A scream breaks the quiet. My wolf, strong hearing, knows the voice instantly. By the three. It's Bri Rose. I speed off in the direction of Bri's cries. Whatever control I was trying to wrest back from my wolf, I hand it all over to my animal side. Everything becomes sensation and instinct. Rocks jut into my paws. Low hanging branches scrape against my fur. Briar Rose's yells grow louder. A guttural growl escapes my throat. Whoever makes her scream, they will bleed. A cabin, a small cabin, appears through the clearing of the trees. Figures now move beyond the windows. Briar Rose. The door shut. 
but that means nothing to me. I leap high into the air and slam my bulk against the barrier. In my wolf form, I'm twelve feet long from snout to tail, not to mention tall as a horse. The door shatters. I land on the cabin floor with a thud. Briar Rose is here. Her skin is all scratched and bloody. Some fucking denarii is parked on her chest and trying to choke the life out of the girl. Oh, hell no. I leap forward, grip the denarii by the throat and toss her through the air. She lands against the wall and slumps to the floor. Briar, crab walks backward, staring at me with wide eyes. She won't die. I, I shot her in the head. I, I shot her in the head. My wolf huffs out a growl laugh. His rumbling voice echoes in the side of my head. Strong mate. Good for pack. Damn, my wolf is in deep. Not that I can worry about that now. I have a denari to kill. I round on the undead freak who's lying motionless at the bottom of the wall. Her head sits at an odd angle, which means I snapped her neck. That won't stop her from coming back, though. The denarii are easy enough to down, but unless you chop off their heads, they always return to life. And to be absolutely certain, they won't regenerate. You need to burn them in a bonfire. I should know. I've destroyed hundreds of them. I have the scars to prove it. I prowl back and forth in front of the prone woman. I don't kill the denarii unless they attack, and they always attack. Sure enough, the woman's eyes pop open. She lets out a howl of rage and leaps towards me. I jump up, grip her head in my jaws, and extend my razor-sharp talons. With a few swipes of my claw, the denarii's head is separated from her body. I fling her skull far from the corpse. I've seen heads reattach if you leave them too close to their bodies. Like I said, the best solution is to burn the corpse, even so. Things are safe enough for now. I round to Briar, who stands against the far wall. She holds her gun straight at me. It's not likely she'd kill me with a Glock, but she could make things pretty uncomfortable. Out the door, Wolf. Briar Rose wiggles the gun towards the busted open doorway. Now. Before I can stop myself, I let out a whine that would make a hungry dog proud. Meat, my wolf whispers inside my head. Want meat? Now, I'd like to punch my wolf in the muzzle, but I can't. So I settle for mentally reminding him of a few unpleasant realities. You can't have her. I don't even get into the fact that a true mate bond with a human is impossible for anyone, let alone me. Instead, I go with logic. Sometimes it works. A half dumb black wolf just burst into her cabin. How about we back off? We go human. For now. My body realigns once again. Agony tears through my limbs as my muscles reform and bones shrink. Fur disappears, claw retract. And soon, I'm back to my human self. But, book naked. Briar Rose's hand pops over her mouth. Oh my god, Knox? Hey. Where we'll spend a lot of time naked, so it is a big deal for us. Humans, however, can get a little freaked. She stares at the ceiling, clearly averting her, grace, her gaze from my naked body. It's cute. Watch out for madame. The denari. Yeah, she could wake back up. Nah. Once the reds are off, they stay down. We do need to burn her body, though, just to be safe. If her red reattaches, then she could regenerate. Oh. Briar Rose glances down from the ceiling, and her gaze spikes right to my waistline. After that, her cheeks burn bright red. It's even cuter. You want to, she clears her throat, <clears throat> put something on? Other than this? Yeah. I'm such a smart ass. I lift the pendant around my neck. It looks like a black opal shaped like a wolf claw. Alec gave me ages ago as a failsafe. It's an all-purpose escape spell from wizard attacks. It's a long story, but witches and wizards, well, him fight like crazy. And Alec and his family have their enemies. He gave this to me to protect me, but right now... It's just a fun way to tease Briar Rose. No. She starts staring at the ceiling again. A necklace doesn't count as clothing. It's a pendant. I'm not a necklace kind of guy. How about you set that gun down first and we can talk? The gun. She looks at the firearm in her hands. Oh, the gun. Right. She places it on a nearby table and turns to face me. So, well, um, clothes? Yeah, you got any. I look around. I didn't bring my stuff with me. 
I point at the dead Denari. Unless you want me to. I leave the logic out there for her to catch up. No! She clears her throat again. I, I mean, no. Don't touch Madame's things. This is Ella's place. She's got some disguises here. Briar face palms herself. I, I mean, she's got some clothes around that might fit you. Don't move. No plans to. I lace my fingers behind my neck. Briar is so shy and blushy, it's totally adorable. My wolf likes it too. No mates, no cubs. In the logic of my wolf, he thinks Briar's awkwardness is a sign that she hasn't dated much, if at all. No mates to compete with, no previous cubs to parent. He's still stuck on that crazy idea that she and I belong together. He's nuts, but I'll deal with it later. Besides, it's easy to ignore my wolf when Briar is still standing there, trying not to stare at my dick. You gonna get me something? I'm smiling, which is somewhat a bastard move to make, but I can't help it. Right. Close. Briar steps off to the bedroom. She rustles around in there for a minute or two and comes back with a pair of loose sweatshorts and t-shirt. She tosses me both of them. I pull on the shorts and read the wording on the shirt. FBI Secret Operation Domino. He doesn't really say that. Briar Rose steps closer. I hold up the shirt as evidence. Last time I checked, the FBI doesn't do theme shirts for their secret ops. That's Ella. I'm sure there's a reason. Briar Rose looks away. Why don't you get dressed and we can talk about the decapitated body on the floor? What? I've got on shorts. She's too easy to tease, this one. Knox, this situation is tough enough without nakedness being brought into things. I slip on the t-shirt because even I know my limits on giving pretty girls a hard time. Now that I'm clothed, I can't help but notice that Briar Rose is almost naked herself. She's wearing these mini sleep shorts and a camisole that leaves little to the imagination. Man, is she ever gorgeous. Wolf likes the way she looks too. I'm not dumb enough to tell her to put anything on though. I nod toward the dead Denari. You know her. She ran my teen Magicorum therapy group. Denari, yeah? She nods. They're evil. She told me. She tilts her head. But you know that already, don't you? Yeah. Briar hugs her elbows. Why was she coming after me? You don't have any magic, right? None. Then I don't know. I rub my chin. It's also strange that you know her. She must have been acting alone. Assassins are almost always strangers. Does she have any reason to carry a grudge against you? Her tums. We don't exactly get along. The only person she might hate more than me is... Briar Rose's eyes widen. Oh no. Ellie. If Madden came after me, maybe someone went for Ellie too. Don't worry. Alex went to check on your friend. Briar Rose gives me a side eye. Somehow that doesn't make me feel any better. He's good people. I could call him and find out what's up. You've got a phone around here. I did. But Madam broke it. There's my computer, but... She turns to the wall of the computer monitors. All of them are dark. She rushes over to them. Oh, crap. I forgot. My system got shot. Like, with a gun? Yeah. It happened in the fight. I save everything in a private cloud, though, so I can get it back. My wolf doesn't understand what she's saying, but I do. And as much as I hate to admit this, I like that Briar Rose can fight the undead geek. And computers. Alex Shaw was right about Briar being different from werewolf women. Female wares are rare. And many get spoiled. They act like pretty princesses. Lots of demands. Not a lot of self-sufficiency. In the long run, that behaviour is the definition of turn-off. I take another long look at the setup Briar Rose has. It's pretty impressive. You're a hacker too. Let's just say I've had a lot of free time on my hands. I nod. There's a story to this girl, that's for sure. I might even want to hear it. Still, we can't hang out around at this crime scene. I glance around the room. You got anything in here you need? You should box it up. Briar Rose tilts her head. It's a canine move, which I like. What do you mean? Even if she went rogue, her superiors will figure out that she came here to kill you. They'll expect a fire. It's standard procedure after they kill a non-Denari. If we burn her body here, it will buy us some time. 
I brace myself, waiting for the whining about all the things she needs. Sounds like a plan. She grabs her bag. I'm ready. My brows lift. Really? She rolls her eyes. Really? And truly. Everything of mine that's important is online. And that's... She points to the ceiling. All in the cloud? Because you're a hacker, right? I shake my head. This girl. You got any kerosene around? It's by the fireplace. Matches too. I can't believe what I'm hearing. Matches too. What? It's just... You're handling this really well. I live with three fairies and got cursed by Colonel Marrill, Marrill in the Magnificent. I'm used to crazy. She sets her fist on her hip, daring me to disagree. I lift my arms and flash her my palms. I get it. You're tough. You just get yourself ready and I'll see you outside. You're going to get rid of that body. That's the plan. Well, I can help. I like that she's tough and all, but getting rid of bodies is a nasty business. I've done it before. But Briar, living with fairies, doesn't prepare you for anything and everything. Look, I say, you can help by double-checking that there isn't anything here, and you are Ella Need. I'll take care of the dead friend here. Well, if you're really sure. I use her own line back to really and for truly. Briar Rose chuckles. I like the sound of that. Okay, fine. She checks all the drawers and finds a few of the trinkets that she'd like to keep. While Bri Rose waits outside, I drag the body onto the couch and douse it with kerosene. The head goes into the fireplace. I also find some matches and pocket them. Soon, we're both standing outside. Bri Rose is still in her cameo mini shorts. Not that I'm complaining, but regular humans usually get chilly this late at night. I check out the horizon. The sky is starting to lighten up behind the trees. It's early morning. All the more reason for her to be cold. Are you sure you don't need a jacket or something? My wolf hates this idea of Briar Rose getting dressed. He wants our so-called maid as close to naked as possible. Nut job. I tell him to shut up, and for once he listens. No, I'm always on the little warm side, if you're sure. I'm sure. She bites her plump lower lip, and that makes me crazy in all sorts of ways I don't want to think about. Something wrong, I ask. I should have said this before, but I was just overwhelmed. She looks at me with her big blue eyes. And I'm a dead man. Thanks for saving my life. Oh, it was nothing, I say quickly. Alec got a tip, that's all. My wolf hates this. No lie to me. We hunt her, protect her. I have had it with my wolf. Shut up! I meant to say it in my mind, but I basically growl it out loud. Shut up, asked Briar. Her eyes glisten, and I feel like a total ass. I was just saying thank you. You don't have to be rude. It's on the tip of my tongue to explain to her that I was talking to my wolf, not her. But that would just mend fences, and honestly, it's better if those fences stay broken. After all, she's human, I'm a wolf. And one of the three, even if we could be mates, the mating ceremony would kill her. It's not worth considering. Let's get back in the car. You can call your friend from there. Briar Rose lifts her chin. That's not all. Once we get there, I want some answers, too. Madame said some strange things to me. I have a suspicion you know what they mean. Madame's the denari were about to roast. Something in Briar Rose's voice sets me on edge. Denari love to blabber when they're going in for a kill. What did she say? She saw the papri. I'm reconstructing and asked me if I knew the location of the fountain. My protective instincts go through the roof. That freak was talking nonsense at you. The fountain is nothing. In truth, the fountain is everything, at least to me. But Briar's in enough trouble without bringing her into all this crap. I don't think so, says Briar. I'm reassembling a full copy of the Book of Magic. I've run across the fountain a few times already. It's important. I can't believe what I'm hearing. The damned Book of Magic. Why doesn't she wear a black top costume and lay it out on the street? Oh, it's dangerous. I knew she was stealing papery and assembling things, but I didn't know it was the damn book of magic. Your what? Assembling a copy of the book of magic. You have a problem with that? Yeah, everything. My wolf doesn't like this either. Stop her, he says. For once I agree with him. I move to stand toe to toe with Briar. I'm tall, even in my human form, and it usually intimidates the crap out of people. Here's the deal. We're burning down this cabin. 
going back to the car, calling your friend. That's it. No questions and answers. No gossiping like a pair of girls at the dance slumber party. Do you understand? Briar glares at me, and the hurt in her eyes tears right through my soul. I understand. You're an ass. I shrug. That's right. I'm a total douchebag. But it's the truth. I'm one of the three wardens, which means that I'm cursed to carry the magic of my people. Alone, no mates, no cubs, no home. And no matter what my wolf feels for Briar, I can never be anything to her but a distraction. As much as it kills me, she's better off without me. And that is the end of this chapter, guys, of Knox and how he saved Briar Rose. Hmm. Thanks for listening. And many blessings.